I have a confession to make. When I was in the ministry, Saturday nights were not my favorite, especially if I was preaching in the morning. Many a time I would toss and turn in the small hours of Sunday morning, and I would get this vivid picture of who did I think I was to presume to stand up and preach in front of other people. It was really unpleasant. And the thing that helped me through was the sentence that, Andrew, if you preach Jesus accurately and reverently, it doesn't matter who you are. And quite honestly, as I sit looking at the camera, the same picture sometimes comes. Who are you to presume that anybody out there will watch this? And it's as if the Lord says, Andrew, your job is to put it out there. Preach me faithfully and accurately, and I'll do what I want to with it. There was a song when we were young people, Let's Talk About Jesus. That's what I want to try and do these weeks before Easter. I'm not going to say much about the coronavirus. There is so much being said about that. Rather, turn our eyes upon Jesus and the things of earth will grow strangely dim. So we come to our reading for this third meditation. Luke 22:14-15. And when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. When the hour came, Shakespeare's Hamlet was very preoccupied with when his hour would come. There is a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. If it be now, it is not to come. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, Yet it will come. The difference between Hamlet and Jesus is that Jesus knew when his hour would come. He had a very clear sense of his calling. And he had a very clear sense in where in his calling he was. For three years, he said three times, my hour has not yet come. And then suddenly this Thursday, three times he says, now is the hour come. Jesus, who was intensely aware of his purpose and where he was in God's plan. And then we read, he was reclining at the table. Now, all Jewish men recline at the table at the Seder, the Passover. Here's a picture of an Orthodox Jew literally lying on a couch in fulfillment of that. And even the most unorthodox Jewish home with a very simple table and chair set, notice that the father's chair has arms to it so that at the Seder he can lean and recline. Why? Because they were commemorating their deliverance from slavery. Slaves stand, free men recline. Jesus had every reason to recline. He was the Son of God, the creator of the world. He could do what he liked. He was free. And he was free in a wonderful other way. And that is that there was nothing between him and God. Sin binds us. And Jesus had none of that bondage. There was nothing blocking his relationship with God. Utterly free. And then he chose to give away his freedom. I lay down my life. No one takes it from me. And within four hours of this Last Supper, he will be bound hand and foot. And within 12 hours, he will have the ultimate captivity, pinioned against a beam of wood. And he did that, that I could be free. It's the greatest truth in the world, if only the world would accept it. And then he said, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you. Those words eagerly desired in the Greek are literally, 
I've desired with desire. It's an intensive. It's saying I couldn't desire more. And I wondered when did I eagerly desire something. I remember as a 10-year-old boy going to a boy's camp, about a 100 of us, and we were in a little log cabin with a dirt floor of bright red dust. My mother said when we got home we looked like red Indians. But on the second day of those four days, I suddenly got homesick. It's an ache and a pain second to none. I eagerly desired to go home. And then when Wendy and I were engaged, we were able, through the generosity of people, to buy a little home in Parkhurst. It was nothing special, just an eighth of an acre. But do you know, sometimes at night we went and parked outside in the street and sat and looked at our house, eagerly desired for the day when we could live in. Did you notice what my two illustrations have in common? They both involved a deep desire to be at home. Jesus eagerly desires to be at home with you and me. He says, I stand at the door and knock, and he's talking to Christians. And if we will open the door, he will come in and do what? He will have a meal with us. And how will we spend that meal? We'll spend it reclining at the table. And that picture of a group of people reclining around a table has three unmistakable implications. The first is intimacy. John was leaning on his bosom for goodness sake. The second is liberty. Jesus wants us to feel completely free in our relationship with him and with God. But the third implication of people reclining around a table is actually almost shocking. For Jews, that meant equality. Of course we're not equal with God or equal with Jesus. And yet he offers us a friendship which borders on it. In Galatians we read, we are co-heirs with Christ. There it is, that kind of equality almost of brothers inheriting together. And it's not something I've earned. An heir has his wealth endowed upon him. Jesus wants to endow upon us a relationship of intimacy, of liberty, and of a brotherhood that borders on unbelievable equality. Now if I could have a kind of brain transplant and, and put that belief deep in my brain, well, I probably wouldn't lie awake on a Saturday night fretting about my worthiness, would I? Jesus eagerly desires to recline at the table with you and me. His wounds have made my room.